Well, CNA is marking its 25th anniversary this month. And so we are taking the opportunity to look ahead to the next quarter century here in Asia. Well, yesterday we looked at the defining role technology will play. Well, today's focus is business and work. And our CNA's Chan yu is our lead editor on this project. Much has been said about the 21st century being the Asian century, with analysts saying that the future is Asian. And some of them project that the region's share of global GDP will hit 52% by 2050. The ADB describes Asia as being in the middle of a historic transformation, and it predicts that by 2050, its per capita income could rise sixfold in purchasing power parity terms to reach Europe's current levels. So today we'll look at how Indonesia's leaders plan to tap their nation's natural resources to become a global powerhouse by 2045, and what India's plans are to balance its rapid economic rise with equitable growth. We'll start off with what Singapore is doing to build a future-ready economy and remain one of the most competitive countries in the world. 57-year-old bus captain C. Elankavan has high blood pressure and cholesterol. The headache of managing his medication, though, is taken care of at work. Prescriptions for him and more than 100 older colleagues are consolidated under a chronic disease management scheme. Because Here's Leonard Lee, managing director of Go Ahead Singapore. Bus captains, they do not need to queue at the, the clinics and, more importantly, ensures that they, they are able to... Um, they do not miss on their medication. And this is really important when you talk about mature and colleagues. Close to 60% of the bus captains here are above 45, and 10% are past the retirement age of 63. It's a clear reflection of how Singapore's labour force is ageing and how companies are adopting more inclusive policies. Manpower Ministry data shows those aged 55 and above comprised 27% of the resident labour force last year, versus about 20% a decade prior. The trend is expected to continue and, although disruptive, is an opportunity to redesign operations. For instance, improving safety and performance with new tech. We are looking at improving the vehicle telematic system that we have into something that um, encompasses AI technology. So when that's in place, then we will have the technicians to also upskill themselves. Just how future-ready is Singapore? One aspect of its 2030 vision for long-term sustainable growth rests on business and workforce transformation. As new technology phases out some jobs, demand is rising for roles in areas such as data analytics and cyber security. Singapore's Homeland Security Science and Tech Agency, HDX, says it plans to double its headcount of 150 within a year. Here's Ng Yao Boon, Deputy Chief Executive of Development at HDX. Example, hackathons, uh, reaching out to students who are interested in data science and AI applications and how they might apply it into uh, public security, public safety problems. The other one is, of course, internships. It also has a mentorship program for those considering a mid-career transition or switch, which mirrors government efforts to keep the workforce competitive. The recent budget unveiled more lifelong learning support for mid-career and older workers looking to stay relevant and schemes to keep Singapore attractive to top-notch global investment. In an annual competitiveness index last year, Singapore dropped one spot to rank fourth among 64 economies, but still remains top in Asia. Some analysts warn that this can't be taken for granted, as neighbours and old rivals like Hong Kong continue to jostle for a bigger piece of the pie. Still, others say this might not be cause for concern. I don't think Here's should Prof Pushandat, Professor of Economics at INSEAD. Instead, what you should think more carefully about are the long-term fundamentals, are they trending in the right direction, are they, are they solid or not. So uh, this is a, the, Singapore focuses too much on rankings and I think we should step back a little bit from that. He adds that Singapore needs to capitalise on its competitive advantage over the next 25 years and strengthen its reputation as a gateway to the rest of the region. Clara Lee, CNA, Singapore. Charged is a new player in the electric vehicle industry in Indonesia. The Singapore-based company started manufacturing its electric motorcycles in January last year from this factory in Tangerang, just outside Jakarta. 
Joel Chang, co-founder of Charged Indonesia, says while many remain apprehensive about EVs, he believes he has a solution. Subscription, in our view, is a game changer for EV adoption because it allows affordable and easy entry into getting into the EV world. New customers always have a lot of concerns regarding EVs. How long is my battery going to last? Is it reliable? What is the real range of the vehicle? Charged is optimistic about the future of EVs in Indonesia. It has a grand vision to produce 10 million electric bikes in the next 10 years. This year alone, it plans to invest more than $37 million to produce 10,000 bikes. This is Santa, the latest in charge to Indonesia's line of electric motorcycles. This is a motocross bike designed for the more adventurous rider. It's powered by a 4 kilowatts battery and has a top speed of 110 kilometers per hour. The recent Indonesia International Motor Show was dominated by EVs, a clear sign of shifting times. And one the government hopes will get it to its goal of 2.5 million EV users by 2025 as affordability and infrastructure improve. More crucially, Indonesia wants to be a global EV player with its abundant reserve of nickel, a main raw material in EV batteries. The government has defended its downstream policy which prohibits the export of critical materials to develop the country's processing and refinery industry. Rahmat Kaimudin is the Deputy Minister for Infrastructure and Transportation at the Coordinating Ministry for Maritime and Investment Affairs. So the export ban for nickel, for example, makes a lot of sense. Nickel ore is less than 2% nickel. The rest is, moisture is 35%. So if you export nickel ore, you're basically ex exporting dirt and water. Doesn't make sense. What you should do is to process it domestically, create higher value add. By harnessing its growing mining sector, some analysts project Indonesia will lead lithium-ion battery manufacturing in Southeast Asia by 2030, also bringing with it foreign investment and job creation. After 10 years of steady growth under Joko Widodo's administration, Indonesia is set to herald a new president. Prabowo Subianto has pledged to continue Mr. Widodo's policies to realize the Golden Indonesia 2045 vision. Joshua Pardede is the chief economist at Pramata Bank. Based on the calculation to be a high-income country by 2045, the Indonesia economic growth should achieve 6 to 7 percent. So hopefully by this uh, policy con continuation in downstreaming, we can have higher investment growth, particularly for the manufacturing sectors, as well as to promote higher value added in export products. Because without any uh, downstreaming, I think we, we will be stuck at the 5 percent growth. The country's global powerhouse ambitions will be put to the test under its new leaders. But with the wheels now set in motion, Indonesia's electric dream may just be the spark needed to chart its course to the finish line. Sefubari Smile, CNA, Jakarta. Sharuk and Shabana Patan live in India's financial capital, Mumbai. Breadwinner Sharuk earns less than $200 a month as a van driver, and they worry about the future. Everything is becoming expensive. Should I take care of my children's expenses or the household expenses, or should I think of my children's future? Their hardship comes despite predictions India will remain the fastest growing major economy this year. The final three months of 2023 saw unexpectedly robust growth. That momentum is driving optimism. Ratings agency Moody's recently hiked its 2024 growth forecast to 6.8%. The Patans aren't alone in feeling left behind. United Nations data shows 230 million Indians lived in poverty in 2021, a little more than 16% of the population. Dial back to 2006 and the figure was more than 50%.
a remarkable improvement in 15 years. Yet inequality remains stark. An Oxfam International report last year showed the bottom half holds only 3% of India's wealth. India's rapid economic expansion is only expected to continue. It's currently the fifth largest economy globally, and ratings agency S&P predicts India will be the third largest by 2030, with its GDP more than doubling to 7.3 trillion US dollars from 3.5 trillion in 2022. How will the government ensure everyone in the world's most populous nation benefits? Data shows incomes in rural India, where most live, trail behind those in urban areas. Economists such as Anita Rangan from Aquarius say job creation is key. The divide even on the urban side is jobs. So which is why I think government is like, you know, focusing on this manufacturing services has already, you know, reached its optimum or seen a good uh, round of increase. Transforming India into a global manufacturing hub and plugging into supply chains is a linchpin of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Make in India initiative. Consultancy Colliers forecasts its manufacturing market will reach $1 trillion by 2026. To get there, analysts say its workforce needs better training and needs to get more women involved. Data is promising. India's female labour force participation rate last year rose to 37%. It was 23% in 2018. The government attributes a jump to policies that empower women, such as better education for girls. Here's economist Anita Rangan again. In any growth, you're not going to be seeing like, you know, it's, it's, it, it cannot be like a, you know, communist kind of a growth where you're seeing like utopian uh, situation. But, but yes, I think that the gaps will narrow and uh, you will see a far more kind of equitable growth uh, going forward because that, that's where, you know, government is like uh, targeting. She also expects policy continuity after the upcoming general election, where it's anticipated Prime Minister Modi will win a rare third term. His vision is for India to be a developed country by 2047, when it marks 100 years of independence. The government says this transformation must be sustainable and inclusive. It's a future that families such as the Patans hope to see more clearly as India's growth story unfolds. Rebecca Bundin, CNA, Mumbai. Thank you.